We're not live, but I am recording. Just me on the video. Who's bugging me? Jack Barton. Jack Barton. All right. Um, let's have a word of prayer. I was looking at James 5 earlier today. And um, Roy, we love you. And we can't imagine what you're going through right now, but it's probably a good idea that we're getting together. I understand. And uh, it's, you know, for more than one reason, but uh, definitely just to just to encourage you and to let you know that we're here for you. And. Um, Let's pray, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit. Father, we love you very much, and we thank you, God, for uh, the mercy that you've extended to us, the blessings, the wonderful things, God, that you've done in our lives. And, Father, I'm reminded always from Scripture of the stories of the people in the Bible. Father, you did not pick the best people. You picked the people who were sinners. You picked the people who were weak. You picked the people and, and didn't hide their sins from those stories in the Bible. We are well aware of men like Noah, who was a drunkard. Solomon, who spent 40 years inside of a wine bottle having parties every night. Father, we're well aware of these of these people in the Bible, both men and women, who struggled with sin, who struggled with the things of the world, and yet, Father, you used them, you sanctified them, uh, even so much so in calling Solomon uh, a holy man of God for his writing of the scriptures. Thank you, God, for using us weak people, Lord, who have tasted of the sins of this world, and we don't, we don't like it. We want heaven. We want righteousness in our lives. We want to honor and please you with those lives. So, Lord, just bless your people tonight. Help us, dear God, when we cannot help ourselves and use us for your kingdom and glory's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I made this statement at uh, Bonnie's, um, when we laid Bonnie to rest <clears throat> Tuesday, uh, something that um, Roy has made mention of before is that he has had a, a speech impediment for years. And um, that has undoubtedly, you know, growing up, any kid that's different, you know, they get picked on, they get, you know, other other boys teasing them or whatever. And um, and it and it occurred to me that I don't know how you and Bonnie met, but when she married you, it just occurred to me that she understood you. And that was that that was probably a, a great blessing to have in your life as a woman that would listen to you and, and understand what you're saying. But not just understand your speech, understand who you are as a man. And... Uh, even though you had your bad days um, and did things that you're not proud of. Um, and there was a time when, you know, Bonnie, she was open about it. There was a time she'd say where I almost thought about just giving up and walking out, but she didn't. She stayed, she stayed to the very end and, and Roy in turn, and this is what blessed me 
was Roy in turn stayed with her to the very end. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad. And to me, it was a blessing the way her death ended up there on a Sunday morning during our service. Uh, while Jan happens to be over there streaming the church over there to her, Bonnie hears us singing and hears us praying for her. And she draws in her last breath as I'm saying, Lord, you know, speed, speed her train ride to heaven. And God, God did a beautiful thing that day in taking her. I mean, he could have done it in the middle of the night with her being all alone. But that's not how he did it. He did it with. Uh, you by her side. It reminds me of the story of Dick and Betty Boyer and both of them having COVID at the same time, being put in the hospital at the same time and then put in the same room together when it became obvious that they were both going downhill and they were literally, their beds were next to each other. They literally were holding hands and I think Dick died first and Bonnie died 30 minutes later. And, um, you know, you just can't, you can't make up stories like that. So the way God did it for you was a blessing. But something that I said at the grave site was, and I, you know, I've had this thing where I tell people that, if you want God to answer a prayer, if you're really a child of God, he never says no. He either gives you exactly what you ask for or he gives you something better than what you ask for. And we don't always know what's better for us. God shows it to us. Israel could have taken a much easier route to the promised land, but it was better for them that they saw the handiwork of God by destroying Pharaoh in the Red Sea and letting them see that. And um, so God removed their enemies that day in front of their eyes, gave them a better thing than just not having enemies at all. Each one of us have discovered about ourselves that we have internal enemies that cause us to do uh, bad things, cause us to seek refuge in the wrong things, to seek help in the wrong things, to seek comfort and soothing in the wrong things. And um, so I was looking over, open your phone, Bibles, or whatever you have to James 5. Um, in verse 5, James said, You have lived in pleasure on the earth. Yeah, we've sampled this world's pleasures. If, if alcohol didn't give a buzz, nobody would... Okay, it'd be, it'd be like milk. There are no milk bars in Jefferson County. Nobody goes and drinks milk with their buddies. Okay. Malachi does. <laughs> yeah, okay, Malachi does. Yeah. But other than that, the alcohol has a buzz. It gives you a high, gives you a feeling. It gives you a soothing, relief, comfort thing. Um, you've lived in pleasure on earth and been wanton and wanton means that you are loose with your morals. You do whatever feels good, whenever it feels good to you, whenever you want. And nobody's going to tell you, no, you're going to drink. You're going to do drugs and nobody's going to stop you. You're not, and you're not going to stop yourself. You've been wanton. You've nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. 
Um, you have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. So in verse 7, and I'm applying this to the benefit of a meeting. Yeah. The benefit of the benefit of reaching out to people who know that we have weaknesses. Um because they can they can give comfort to us. People who don't who have never been down this road, they don't they don't know what it's like. They don't know what it's like to be high and then to crave that feeling. They don't understand it. And so they really can't provide comfort. Those who have done it understand it. And instead of looking um, down at everybody or down at you, they look at you and say, let's, we're here to help. I, um, when I first started going to uh, up at um, the doctor I go see when I first was getting off the pain pills and taking Suboxone, um, every now and then I would I would revert back to some pain pills and. Um, so you go up, you go up there and they, you got to do a drug test and, you know, it's, and you get this feel. And I will say at one time they had a nurse up there that treated everybody like dirt. And I complained and that gal's not there anymore. And I actually saw her get chewed out after one of my complaints. I saw her get chewed out because she treated everybody like they were a dirty dog. And I'm going, these people feel bad enough. Okay, they don't need that. And the doctor that I saw, he said, I, you know, I was apologizing to him and he said, no, no, no. You need to understand we're here to help. He was an Indian doctor, but he, he was a good guy. And he said, we're, we're here to help you. We're here to help you and to try to teach you how to overcome your desire for whatever it is, whether it's meth or whether it's heroin or whether it's alcohol or whether it's pain pills or whatever. We're here to help you to overcome those things. And that made me feel good. I, I really appreciated that he said that, that he didn't try to chew me out, give me some lecture if you do this again, we'll kick you out of our program. He didn't say anything like that. He said, we're here to help you. So in verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Thankfully, when the Lord comes, we won't have these meetings anymore. Won't need them. But as long as we carry this flesh body with us that craves and desires the wrong things, Need to have a meeting every now and then. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, which is the farmer guy, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. The early rain is the rain that you get after you plant your seeds, Roy. And then you want a really good rain before it's time to pick, to beef the tomatoes up, tomatoes draw in all that moisture, whatever, and get good and hearty. And that's what the early and latter rain was. Then he says, be ye also patient. Establish your heart. Establish. We could say establish, and that would be close to the same thing. But it means stabilize your heart. And something that I uh, I heard it in a video 
about a year ago, and it just really grabbed my attention, was the fact that your heart has 40,000 brain cells, neurons. Your heart literally is a brain that thinks and makes decisions for you in your body. The Bible's not wrong when it says that when we our belief in God is not in our brain, it's from our heart. Our heart believes under righteousness. Our heart believes in God. It believes this Bible. It believes the things that we do. And it's because our heart is a a brain that's I think connected directly to our soul. And that's and it's our soul that makes these decisions for us. And he says, um, establish your heart. So stabilize. You get in a stable environment, which means you're not running with the guys who are drinking, who are cooking meth, or who are doing meth, or who are selling meth. You're staying away from these guys on an active basis. And it's, and it's now become part of your life to not go that direction anymore. You've, you've become stable. Uh, I have gotten to the point. And I won't say that I don't desire the feeling that comes from pain pills. I won't say that. But the desire to just sit and take them is gone because I know from the experience that it just gets worse and worse. Um, at my worst, I was taking 10 of them, 10, 10 milligram Percocets, 100 milligrams of Percocet at a time, just, just to to feel the effect of it. Uh, when I had the stimulator put in my back, they gave me, you know, a small amount of pain pills for the, for like the, a few days worth. And even after not having any for several years, it still took bare minimum was six. Bare minimum was six. I didn't, my body hasn't reset down to one. And I don't think it ever will. Yeah, I don't think it does. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 So, um, Roy, you've been dry 20, 22 years, 32 years, but still it would probably, if he were to pick it up tonight, it would be a full bottle, every bit of a full bottle. Um, so we know we get to a point where we say, even if, even if I had a whole bottle of Jack Daniels, or I had a whole bottle of pain pills, they would be gone in just a, a, a very short time. What good would it do me? Because then I would be out quickly. And what good would it do me? Yeah. Yeah, you're back in pain again. So I, I did. I, I told the nurse practitioner that I see. And I said, I, I do. I think I've gotten to the point to where I don't. I just. I'm not worried. Right now that. Um. 
I'm going to fall back into the pain pills again. Now it could happen. Okay. Yeah. How many bottles did Bonnie find after she thought you were done? Four. Oh, man. And she poured the whole thing out? Full fifth? <laughs> there was a young man. I will never forget this guy. There was a young man in the group meetings I was doing. And I've really felt for him because he was a pastor's son. His dad was a missionary over in the Far East somewhere. And he grew up over there. And um, his dad got caught um, visiting prostitutes over there, being a missionary. And so whatever church group he was with, they had him step down from his ministry and he, they, I guess they defrocked him or whatever. And it hit this boy hard. And he immediately went right into drugs. And so we would, we would see him every meeting. And so we got to a meeting one time and the, the meeting leader guy, um, who I really liked. He was a, God knew who to put me with. He was a Bible college graduate and he was the right guy for me. So I, so I really listened to what he said, but he brought up the fact that this young man, uh, relapsed and they, so he said, you're, you need to talk about this. What happened? And he said these words. He said, well, he said, uh, I uh, was cleaning my room and he said, I found an old stash that I had forgotten about. And he said that it just was there. I had it in my hand and I took it. I don't remember what drug it was or whatever. And he's telling this and I think the Holy Ghost is helping me. Because I said, when he got done, I said, I'm going to say something. And I said, I hope I'm not out of line because I'm not really in charge here. I said, but I think you're lying to yourself and to everybody in this group. I think you have probably more than one stash hiding in your room. And you should probably take somebody from this group to your house to have them help you get all of your stashes cleaned out. Because I think you've got more and you know where they are right now. After that meeting, a couple hours after that meeting, Raleigh, the, the meeting leader, called me. And he said, boy, were you dead on the nose. He said, we, he's in the hospital now in detox. And he said, he had that stuff all in his room. He said, how'd you know that? I said, it just, there was just something about what he said to me that said he's lying through his teeth. He had his, he's, he tells himself, I'm going into rehab, but I'm going to have my fallback stash for when it gets bad. Okay, he had his fallback stash, and I called him out on it. Yeah. Yeah. 
and a third, a nice day strip the end of the end, and a 30 day strip the part and it's like, you need to do it all the way. Because we don't want you, and I, even though it was prescribed to me, and that was the money yeah. I received, said, we don't want you having anything come back, come back to any, which I am grateful for. So. Yeah, exactly. So, here about six months, seven months ago, here about. I was in the house, it was building up in me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to drink. Yeah. So, you know where I live at. Mm -hmm. When I, I got down to TT in 61, I could make it. The right hand turn went to BT. But for the same reason I turned to the left, I was heading for 66. I pulled into the park lot at the hospital. Yep, I remember that. Yeah. I sat there. I don't know how to go. My guts was turning this way and that way, and uh, at so long time, I did. Uh, well, I had my phone with me. I called my buddy up. Yeah. And he finally talked me down. Because I want to just go ahead and go up to 66 and get that bottle. Yeah. You were close. That's what I was going to say. I, I, I had a chance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here's. Uh, Here's what I was going to say next. The next verse, verse 9. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. So. But, you know, grudge back. Yes, go ahead. Don't make any difference if it's alcohol or drugs. It's all the same. It will mess your mind and body. Up. Sure it will. Yeah. Uh, the only difference. Alcohol is legal and drugs is legal. Well, so relatively. It is. I want to make you feel better, you know, it don't matter what it would look like. You know, people separate, separate addictions from sin. Yeah. It's really just all the same thing. Um, I, I just want my head down the bottle where I could forget that very thing. Yeah. And I guess one thing that helped me was I was sat right across from the nursing home. Where Bonnie was. Yeah. And you look back now and you say, I'm glad I didn't do that. It's okay to reward yourself with an emotional treat or, or a little bit of pride saying, I hear the shit. Yeah. Right. So what would happen if, how, how should I treat, let's say if, if Roy came in church next Wednesday night, and I and I smelled alcohol on his breath. How should I treat him? The very next verse, verse nine. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. And with people with addictions, get mad at them is not the answer. Now, we have, and the reason why people get mad to begin with is fear. That the emotion starts out as fear and turns quickly with a lot of people into anger. And that's, that's a, 
immediate response because the fear is I don't want to go back with you to these old days. Okay. I don't, if, if you're going to drink, you just go on, get out of my life and you go drink. And because there is a, there is a fear that the innocent people in our lives are going to have to go through what they've been through before with us. And they don't want to do that. But, you know, the relationship that Alicia and I have together is we're very close. Um, but years ago, I would catch myself saying things to her that, that upset her. It hurt her, hurt her feelings. And I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, I don't like to say things to my wife that hurts her feelings. So I, so I just don't. And so if, if Alicia were to get in a relapse, my response toward her should be in love and not, a, and not a grudge. Because the Bible says charity covereth the multitude of sins. And um, Brian and Pam, your relationship, your marriage together. If you suspected one or the other had relapsed, how should your response be to it? Should it be in anger with a grudge or should it be... Okay, let's talk. Okay, what happened? Yep. Yeah, and, and I don't, I don't want that out of you guys. We don't want that. You don't want that out of each other. You've got kids to raise. You have responsibilities between you both that, uh, you, you have to do them. Uh, God wants to bless your marriage. The devil wants to tear it apart. And in the case of, you know, are you relapsing? Are you thinking about it? Let's talk, not let's get into a knockdown drag out to where, cause, I, cause what'll happen is, so let's say, let's say Brian is getting close to relapsing and Pam figured it out. So Pam goes to him, yelling and screaming at him, throwing pots and pans across the room, doing karate kicks in the air and everything like that. And uh, next thing you know, Pam says, well, if he's going to do it, I am too. Now you got both of you. Okay. And that's, that's that verse, grudge not against. Grudge not one against another, brethren, unless you be condemned. So, remember, um, our office, our co-counsel, our co-counsel, you have dreams, and your subconscious is telling you that the fun part of using your well, what you thought was fun. Not yeah. the fun part, but what you thought. So, years ago, West County, they still got the new gun. Uh, meeting at uh, West County. When I first started going there, he talked about some hardcore AA people. Men and women, they would get back in their case face on. And I came close to not go going there because I didn't want to face but yeah get on and they uh, didn't pat you on the back say oh take it easy no everything be okay no they they got right, right in, in their case and I mean they was hardcore when I when and I they, but when I came down here, there was one AA meeting 
Yeah. Over here at this here Presbyterian church. I was start going later and this one guy. Uh, I think his name was Tim. It's been so long ago. But he was like a dog going in and out in the stove. Every time he come back in, everybody said, oh, it's okay. You know, and he was filling up in And if you've been at a meeting, you've got a table, and everybody takes a turn. Well, it was down at the other end. I was over here trying to came out for me. And he was more or less crying his beer. And I don't know more. I ain't going to do it no more. Yeah. I turn. Go stand in front. Go in the bathroom. Stand in front of the mirror. Tell that person you see. Mm -hmm. And you talk about. They more more asked ask me not to tell the back kickers. I was too hardcore. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's why I am. Uh, if you can go stand in front of the mirror and convince that person you see that you don't have a problem, okay. Because the mirror would tell all. When I when I address the young man whose dad was a missionary. I I had to I knew I had to deal squarely with him straight on. Yeah, by the way, I got the goodies in here. Brian, I brought your favorite coffee cakes. Um I think I think there's a way to do it. I shot I, sh I shot straight with him, but I, I did so in a way that it didn't. Th there's a there's a way to talk to somebody and and give the Bible says preach the truth in love. Now, two ways two ways of going about things. One way is I'm going to tell you the truth and I don't care how you deal with it. Yeah. That to me is the wrong way. The right way is I'm going to tell you the truth and I'm going to say it in a, such a way as I want you to know that I care about how about how you turn out. And um, the, the Bible, especially in Galatians, bear ye one another's burdens. Galatians 6, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself also, lest thou also be like unto him. So go ahead. Spiritual thing right there, you know. Yeah. That, and it says here, brethren. So a lot of people, you know, like, you know, I'm an AA and you know some of these treatment centers. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not all alike, you know. So it does take you know brethren on brethren. Yeah. To have that kind of love and understanding, you know, what we're going through, you know, how our hearts can change, you know, with God. And, uh, it has a lot to do with it, you know. When you just meet somebody out there in addiction, a lot of times they're far from God. And yeah. They don't know how to treat each other. I think you have to consider the person. Like, I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah. You have to consider the person. Some people, you can't, some, some people can't join the army. Okay? Not everybody can join the army. Not everybody can take... The, the hardness of the life, the, the strictness of it, not everybody can do that. I considered military at one point in my life, but 
um, early on, but I'm I'm glad I didn't because I think I probably would have I would have mustered out because I don't I don't think that would have been for me. I don't think that was my life, and I think you have to it, with some people you have to you have to address them firmly, but show them that you care. Okay, we we're we had an experience in this church with a guy. Um, I've mentioned his name before, Ryan. He is he is the without a doubt the most judgmental person I have ever met in my life, and to him, you better be right on everything, or he's going to clean your clock, and. He's in his mind. He thinks he has a right to give you exactly what you deserve for being wrong about something. And I've told him multiple times in my office in private, you can't treat people. If you if you don't love people, then don't ask me to preach behind my pulpit. You can tell the truth, but not do it in love. And not doing it love means you don't care about how this ends. You don't care about how it all turns out. You don't care about restoring them. All you care about is being right and playing king of the mountain and I'm on top. Back to you, just giving you that. Um, just going back to the girl that I'm caught up before using the yeah. worst way possible. And anyway, so um, how, how do I show him and tell him that God's blessings that He has given us while we were, while, after we straighten up without, without making it sound like, how do I say that in love? You know, how do I say, look, instead of like, you know, from the hurt that he's living at because I know he's a better person. So I don't know how to tell him, you know, we've been cleaning for well, less than a year, a mm. year and a half, and we're already, we're already buying a house and our credit's up. And, yeah. And I said, there's, there's blessings, you know, but I, he's like, yeah, I know. He, he doesn't want to hear it. I can't do it. No. You don't get one. You don't get two. No, you won't get one. Sorry. But um, I don't know how to say it without bragging, I guess. You know, I don't want to I tell us I'm not trying to well, brag, but I'm trying to show you that there's a better light. Yeah. Is that, is that how I do it? Yeah, and the, again, there's a, way, there's a way to be firm, but doing it in love means... Mm -hmm. Like in Galatians, with the object of restoring them. In the case of, let's say, and I've had to do this before. Let's say that, you know, it it was brought to my attention that somebody in the church was not living right. So I went to them, and and it, I I could have done this one of two ways. I could have said, look, I found out something. And you know what? I'm just not going to tolerate that. So I think it's probably best that you go somewhere else. Okay? I could have done it that way. But what I did was I heard that this happened. Is it true? And they were honest. Yes. And I said, okay. And... You know, their immediate reaction was, well, why does this matter to you? And my response is, you go to church here. And I have a responsibility. Okay, I don't like doing this. I'd rather stay out of it. But you're a member of this church. And I'm aware of something you've admitted to. And I said, Trust me, if you if you repent now, it doesn't leave this office. And nobody in the whole world has to know anything other than you and I. 
And after a while, they said, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And we prayed and it's over with. My, my, my whole point was in, number one, trying to correct what was done wrong and keep the person that did the wrong in a right relationship, number one, with me, number two, with this church, number three, with God in, you know, in particular. Um, people have come to me without me going to them and said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I got something that's on me. It's, it's, there are things that I do. I, I can't. And I listen to this and we pray. And as far as anybody in the church knowing anything about it after that, it's over with. Nobody has a right to it. And it's the idea that I'm doing this in love to restore them because I care about how they turn out. This is not boot camp. Okay? This is not boot camp. Now, there may be a one of a hundred who you can and should get right in their face because they can handle it and they want it that way, but it's usually not most people that I know of. That's why... Brian and I feel like we can come to you because you do come to us with with the idea of frustration. And you wanna you wanna make it right just as much as for us that just as much as we want to make it right with God, you do too. You know, it makes it so much easier to it makes it so much easier to come to as a as a pastor, you know. I've told you guys I love you. Mm-hmm. And I, those are not just words that I say. I mean it. And um, I think the world of you guys, um, this is this is our fellowship. And I know I know what's up. I've been through all of this stuff and I know the devil's just trying to mess stuff up. So verse 16, if we skip down very quickly, confess your faults one to another. Now, not this is not a priest confessional. He didn't say sins, but it's a generalized faults, not individual sins, but confess your faults one to another. And what that does, it's like this. Everybody's going to, we're going to be honest here. Why are we sitting at this table? Because there's free snacks? No, because we have problems. Okay. So there's no use lying about it. No use. You too. Yeah, exactly. It is accountability. And that's what I was going to get at. Yeah. I bought a bottle of paint for him. That was really, really, really hard. Yeah. A year or so ago, I was probably going back there with one guy that was coming into the church. And he turned around and the guy on to me. We have some business here for some time now. Mm hmm. A uh, good short guy. Yeah. yeah. I guess. Me being, I don't know, uh, barn corner, butt hole, or what. I told the guy, I gave him my phone number. I say, here, you call me before you pick up the drink. You talk, I will come to you, or you come to me. But, I can tell. Mm-hmm. Do, I won't talk to you. Go ahead and finish the bottle or whatever you're going to do. So, I I have seen that guy. And I don't know when. So hmm. I don't know. Being hardcore <laughs> like I am, I sh- maybe I should show more passion. But, uh, I guess I fall back to the 
bunch, no bunch that was, uh, they got me uh, helping me get sober. Yeah. They was, I can say, hardcore AA. Uh, 12 steps, and that's the way you did it. No, you know. Yeah. 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 I don't want the past to find you. I think that's what it was. Yeah. But I'm not an addict. I had a problem. I had a sin. Yeah. But I'm not. That's not who defines me. That's right. That's not who defines anybody. That's an addict. As long as you're forgiven, mm-hmm. I'm living that. Living that. But <laughs> that's about like that. at the same time, it, well, you know, Brian's like, what do you say? It holds you accountable or, mm-hmm. or it gives you. A, a motivator if you do look in the past. There's a. Yeah, it hurts when you fall too. There's a there's a fine line between dwelling too much in the past, mm-hmm. but keeping it healthy enough to remember the pit that God dug you out of. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. Understanding. Uh, Understanding who you used to be. Okay. And, um, I think you're talking about the old man. Yeah. When the old, when the old man, when you're saved, the old man is no longer in you. There's a new body. Remember, that's what you were talking about last Sunday. Yeah, a new nature. Yeah. That is there to, to try to fight off the old nature. Okay, and this is where, in in my opinion, AA doesn't go far enough because it makes a generalized higher power instead of instead. That's the difference. This this group meeting is not an AA meeting. It is a Bible study because we are here because God did something in us. That changed us. And and we want that change to be permanent. The reason why they say a higher power is because there are so many different people. Some is G, some yeah. Right, I understand that. So... They, 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 they use that one term to cover yeah. everything yeah. without uh, you know, offending somebody. Right. Um, I don't know if that's the right way or the wrong way, but uh, yeah. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. That ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So when we pray now, God doesn't look at what we used to be and says, who are you? The guy who was drinking a a bottle a day or the guy who was taking, you know, 20 pain pills a day or who are you? to talk to me. God doesn't see it that way anymore. He follows up with Elijah. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Um, So God doesn't, your responsibility, Brian, is to pray for Pam. Because if Pam 
is blessed and strong, she's going to be there for you because you're going to need her. Meanwhile, her responsibility is to pray for you because you are the house band. I talked about that a while back. You're the one that holds the house together and actually, actually your presence in the house keeps a significant amount of devils out of your, out of your family. It does. You're standing a post guarding your and protecting your family and devils see that and they will come, they won't come near it. So your responsibility is to pray for her and she prays for you that both of you are strengthened that on one day when you're having a bad day, hopefully she's not. And then when you're having the bad day, hopefully he's not having the bad day. That's what I was talking about, the dream. Yeah. If I go to him right when I write the next morning and say, hey, you're like, this is what I dream about. And I'm not going to let it affect me, but I'm, I'm afraid it's going to be, you know. And he talks to me. He talks to me and he, he reminds me of this is not where you want to be, you know. So it's. Worst thing is to have a dream and start your day off. Yeah. Like, what those dreams where you like you dream or you do a drug or something like that, and then you just all of a sudden remember that oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna have a dream. Yeah, that's 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 part of that's part of that. Let me let me close with this. Brethren, if any this is verse nineteen. Brethren, if any of you do err, so number one to all the people in the world who say after you get saved, you don't sin anymore. Read your Bible. Mm -hmm. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And I think that's not only, it's like if, Brian's the one that called this meeting, okay? So I don't know exactly what's going on with you, but you mentioned something about you're taking pain pills now, okay? You don't want to get triggered, and you don't want to get hooked on the pain pills, okay? So I get that. I understand that. Um, so, but if, if you snap and have a relapse or whatever and this is what all of this is about is what happens if somebody here relapses what are we going to, how are we going to deal with it what are we going to do about it is it possible it's always possible it's always going to be possible okay um understand that it's not the end of the world it's not the end of your sobriety. It's just a time to look at the mistake you made, figure out what brought that about. Don't do that again and move on. And that's what he's saying here. You're saving a soul from death. That's what you're doing. You're covering a multitude of sins, not just theirs, but yours as well. God's going to bless you as a result. Now, if you if you go to them all ignorant and say, yeah, we're just going to throw you out of the church. Um, then watch out. You're probably going to be next on the list of getting thrown out. Yeah. Any, any kind of mind altering can bring you right back to where you where you were. Yeah. Where, where you where your where your place was. It's anything can bring you back to yep. alcohol. Like if alcohol is not your energetic choice, it can bring you back mm -hmm. to to it. Mm-hmm. It is very fragile. Yes, 
Okay. I got a choice. Both is going to kill me. Now, do I want that a scroll, merciful death, stick my head back in a whiskey bottle? Or shall I take this for nine I got on my side and go ahead and throw my brains out and get up? Oh, because the alcohol is going to cause me to have a scroll, merciful death. Yeah. Or should I just get away with it all at one time? But I have screwed things up so much. If I take the nine, try to grow my brains out, I probably end up in the hospital. Yeah. I told you. Yeah. That's so funny. About the driving. My luck, I said, I'll survive it. And... Um, let me say this, and then we'll we'll close. Um, Roy, obviously, you know, all of us in this group are thinking of you mm-hmm. right now and praying for you um, because of the fact that you lost your wife. And, uh, and everything that you've been through to, to sit and watch her waste away the, the emotional things that it's, that it's brought to you. I know. I know. And so, um, my question is to you is do you have a plan that you can work in that you can put in place that on a day when the sorrow the loneliness everything hits that you can avoid grabbing the car keys, trying to drive to Philip 66, get a pint. Is there, have you thought about what you can do when the, when the bad days hit? Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I got to take care of it one day at a time. I understand. Uh, for me to be honest with you, say, no, I got this here. I can turn to. Uh, no. I, I strictly, uh, this here past week now, uh, for the uh, service at the JB, I was taking it one hour at a time. Yeah. Uh, I had two years to almost be by myself. Yeah. And then, for a second, she ain't there anymore. Period. Yeah. It, it just hit me. Yeah. That that house is completely empty now. Mm-hmm. And there for the longest time until the service, I I was very. Like you were in a daze Tuesday. I noticed that. But let me suggest to you that you put some thought into it. I know AA has taught you that you take it one day at a time. But in in a lot of other areas in life, we plan things. 
Exactly. There, there are things I think that you can plan to do in case the tornado comes and wants to drive you down to Bottle City and um, uh, you see, it takes a, a drunk to talk to a drunk. Until somebody really walk in your shoes. You don't know what that person is. Well, yeah, I agree with you. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, would you, I think you ought to give some thought to what some things that you can do on, on the long, let's say the lonely day, there's going to be a day come two weeks from now. It's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. It's going to be the loneliest day in the world. You're going to realize Bonnie's not there. Your old way of dealing with things 32 years ago was to go get drunk. Okay. Some of that stuff, some of that's still in you. Some of it may not be in you. What I'm saying is at least have a, have a, some sort of plan on what you can do on that day to where a you're not lonely anymore you're around people you have a place to go to you have people you can call you have something that will go and keep your mind busy instead of just sitting in the chair thinking Bonnie's gone Bonnie's gone Bonnie's gone Bonnie's gone and um, I don't, Alicia just said that that was one of the tools that they gave her in her two week rehab was how to have a plan on the day when it is so bad that all you want to do is get drunk or get high or whatever or end your life. Um, so I, I, I'm going to pray for you about that. And if anybody has any suggestions, uh, give Roy a call and say, Roy, I got an idea for you. And okay. Call John and. Say, hey, does your kids want to spend a day with Uncle Roy? Okay. And he'll bring the kids over and you can play cards with them or something like that. Show them how to cheat at poker or whatever. Anything, anything to get your mind off of where it went that day. Have, a, have, have an idea in your mind of what you can do. When that day comes, if that day comes, or when that day comes, so that you have something else to divert you away from driving down and getting a bottle. Okay? Exactly. Okay? It's, it's a life insurance policy. Why do you get a life insurance policy? Why did you and Bonnie start going to church? Because you realize you were going to hell. And uh, you found out that you didn't go to hell the next day. So, but you are eventually going to die. And Bonnie got saved. That's why I asked you, what, what, when did Bonnie get saved? So, so let's say it's been 18 years ago. She didn't know when it was going to happen, but she, yeah. She didn't know when it was going to happen, but she made, she made the plan for when that day comes and she was ready for it. That's my point in this is to, is to work out a plan of something you can do.
to get your mind off of the bottomless pit that it's going to get into on a day when 